The Bible says in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless in the heir of my house? Is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And the Bible says in verse 6, maybe one of the most important verses in all of Scripture, and he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your presence this morning. Uh, we, we feel it, God. We are experiencing you dwelling among your people and the truth is, you always do. It's the promise you've given us in Scripture. And we thank you, God, for being faithful always to fulfill your promises to us. You've never faltered. You've never not come through. God, you've never dropped the ball. You're worthy. You're worthy of our trust. And, and we pray today, God, that you would strengthen our hearts even as some of us are battling against doubt and fear and unbelief, God, we pray even in the, in the center of those difficult times that the victory would be born, that we would turn our whole hearts to you, and that we would, with reckless abandon, follow you with all of our hearts and our souls. God, we pray, teach us today in Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. Sometimes the greatest victories come when de defeat seems inevitable, and you know, as I think about that, of course, I think of Super Bowl 51, <laughs> right? Patriots, Falcons. I mean, I think there was so much stress involved in that particular game, I may have lost a couple years off of my life. But, but I remember how disappointed I was when uh, we got to halftime, and the score was Falcons 21, Patriots 3. And the Patriots were playing, anybody remember this game? I mean, how, how could you not remember it? Listed as the third greatest comeback in sports history. But I remember at halftime, I was so disappointed, and you know, it was magnified, it was worse, because we had a huge outreach that day. And so, you know, we were uh, watching the football game together in the gymnasium, and then it was all tied to an evangelistic outreach. Uh, and, you know, so here I've got this gospel message that I'm, I'm, I've worked on and I've prepared for, and my team is totally tanking. And it was so absolutely disappointing, right? And we take sports pretty seriously in our house. So, so I remember at halftime, I'm so disappointed with my team, and I'm thinking, you know, I've got to preach the gospel here. And so, so I just, I left, I left the outreach, I went to my office, and for me it was like, the game is over, it's done, I, I'm not a believer, there's no possibility of comeback. Uh, and so, you know, I would check in from time to time, just to, to peek to see what the score was. Third quarter, really not any better, I think it was 28 to 9 at that point. And so really, really, uh, there was no hope for victory whatsoever. Uh, shut everything off. And uh, finished wrapping up my preparation, coming back, you know, to time it just right so that the gospel could be preached as the game had just ended, only to discover that my team in the end had won an amazing victory, an extraordinary day. Thank you for your applause this morning because... <laughs> But you know, look, you know, it is, it is hard to believe when all the evidence seems to be stacked against you. Right? I mean, somebody in that locker room had to 
had to have had faith in the team, had to have believed that victory was still a possibility. But when you're in that place and it just seems like nothing is going your way, um, and then like let, let's just pull this into our relationship with God. There are promises that he has made and nothing seems to be manifesting itself. You know, those are hard times. Those are hard times. I, I don't think we like to talk about the reality of doubt in our Christian circles, but the truth is we all struggle with doubt from time to time. And Abraham certainly did as well. You know, some people have framed this as the dark night of the soul for Abraham, maybe one of his most difficult moments in his relationship with God. Genesis, if we're going to rank them today, Genesis chapter 22 would be up there as well. You know, when God called Abraham to offer as a sacrifice the son of promise, But for Abraham in this moment, it felt like, and there's no doubt, I'm not reading into scripture here. You can read these verses and you know it's like palpable what what Abraham is going through. Literally the walls are closing in on him. Literally the walls are closing in on him. There's no evidence whatsoever that God is fulfilling this great promise that he had given to him. And yet in the midst of this maybe most difficult moment of Abraham's life, there is is something that happens. You know, God works in Abraham this beautiful miracle. God births a resolve in Abraham's life in the agony of his indecision. In this difficult spot, there is this resolve that is born. It was in the crucible of seeming defeat that Abraham experienced his greatest victory. And the crazy thing is this, when you're in the midst of what feels like defeat, it is the last, victory is the last thing on your mind. Victory is the last thing on your mind because you know you can't see it. There's no evidence uh, in the circumstances of your life that it is just around the corner. But the truth is that just as this dark night of the soul was where God birthed belief and resolve in Abraham's life, it can be the same for you. Maybe today you've walked in with struggle and and difficulty and and all you see are the circumstances of your life unraveling all around you, and yet if you're a child of God, I'm saying to you that even the darkness of defeat can be the moment of victory if you put your trust and faith in the Lord. The most impactful spiritual moments come when circumstances are the bleakest because they birth belief in God. Do you believe that today? Have you experienced that today? Have you experienced that in your life? You know, some of you have, and maybe some of you are brand new in your faith, you know, and and all of this that I'm saying today does not sound very encouraging because, you know, you thought, hey, uh, your relationship with Jesus, there is no more dark night of the soul. There is no struggling with doubt. There is no difficulty of circumstance. And yet for the child of God, there's a deeper work. God doesn't want you to have a shallow faith. God doesn't want you to, God doesn't want your Christianity to just be a veneer that covers a different reality deep within your heart. And if our roots of faith are going to go deep, what does God do? He he brings us into the storm. He brings us into the adversity. He brings us into the difficulty. So in those seemingly bleak moments, what can happen in our lives is that real deep belief and faith in God can be born. And I just want to ask you today, is that the way it's working for you? Is that the way that it's working for you? Because, you know, sometimes we unravel as Christians, Sometimes we unravel. Sometimes we begin to to go through uh, a process in our hearts and minds or we start walking down a road that doesn't lead us towards God. It leads us away from God. God walks Abraham through this today. And I think, you know, this, there, there are some powerful, profound truths in these verses. Honestly, I'll tell you, I feel so inadequate even teaching on them today because they're just extraordinary, but I think God has some take-home truths for us. I just want to mention a couple of things today. Number one is this. Abraham was in a self-imposed box of unbelief. Abraham was in a self-imposed box of unbelief. You know, this was post-victory. So the scripture says in verse 1 of chapter 15, after these things, uh, we're, we're not always sure uh, what the time frame is when the Bible says after these things, but it would appear 
that this is not too long after the victory that God gave Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. We talked about this last week. If you weren't present with us, you can check it out online. But there was a, an extraordinary victory, right? I mean, he was totally outnumbered, strategic risk. He was fighting a battle that was on foreign territory. Uh, so for Abraham, of course, he was doing the right thing. Maybe God, in fact, was bailing him out because Lot should have never been with him in the first place. But he goes up, God grants him the victory, and, and so he's on the mountaintop. Are you with me? He's on the mountaintop. There's just been this extraordinary experience of God, tangible uh, evidence of God working on behalf of Abraham. And then right out after this mountaintop experience, man, Abraham finds himself in this deep valley of unbelief and doubt. I just do want to say to you today that oftentimes after the mountaintop experience with God, there's a valley. There's a valley that we go through. There's a valley that sometimes we're confronted with. And that mountaintop experience isn't just to give us a high for a moment, it's to prepare us for what God is leading us into. Understand that today. And God was leading Abraham into this deeper experience of trust and faith. Abraham in this moment, this is what's happening, this great father of faith. That's what we call Abraham, the father of faith. He's struggling with doubt. You know, I want to I say this to you today. I want to say it carefully because you know, we, of course, would never encourage you to doubt, but the truth is this, it is okay to wrestle with doubt. It is okay to wrestle against doubt. In fact, it's human. When you look at the great characters of Scripture, you know, I think sometimes we, we frame them like Marvel superheroes, right? Maybe Marvel's more honest about their characters than sometimes we are about the characters of Scripture, I mean, the Scripture is honest about their struggles and their difficulties, but you know, sometimes just from, we, have this, we have this attitude because they're archetypes, they're people that we respect, they're giants of the faith, and sometimes, sometimes when we think about these great figures of Scripture, uh, we don't consider the moments of weakness in their life, we just think, hey, you know, they, they always trusted, they always had faith, they were perfect in their faith, they never struggled with doubt, and that's not true. I mean, clearly Peter struggled, right? Peter struggled with doubt. Peter himself walked through very challenging times in his relationship with Christ, even to the point of denying him. Paul struggled. Paul battled. There were things that God allowed in Paul's life that Paul did not like. Paul did not like the thorn in the flesh. He did not like the thorn in the flesh. And the Bible says he prayed three times for the Lord to to take it away, listen, if you're praying three times, that means that, you, you know, you're, you're battling something. You're going back and you're asking God to do something that he, he has not done yet. And then he just gets a word from God that settles it, you know, once and for all, my grace is sufficient for you. Let me remind you today that God's grace is sufficient for you. That's not the point of the message, but David struggled with doubt. God, why is it that the unrighteous seem to prosper and the righteous seem to suffer? I don't get this. God, I don't get this. Sarah struggled with doubt. We're going to see in a couple of chapters that, you know, the angel of the Lord comes and gives a reiteration of the promise and Sarah laughs in her, in her heart. Belief doesn't mean the absence of doubt, all right? Belief does not mean the absence of doubt. It means that while you're struggling with doubt, you make the choice to believe. It means that in the midst of struggling against doubt, there's a decision, there's a choice that you make. In fact, look, if we're going to frame belief as worship to God, don't you think that that expression of worship actually might mean more? When you're confronted with adversity and difficulty and in that place of even internal struggle where you're doubting because the circumstances don't line up, you know, when, when that battle is happening and you choose to believe, if belief is an expression of worship to God, how much more precious are those moments where when it's hard, when it's difficult, you still choose to put your trust and faith in the Lord this doubt that Abraham was wrestling against was not accusatory doubt. He wasn't against God. He wasn't accusing God. Um, it wasn't necessarily just a resistance to the revelation that God had given. You know, sometimes there's so much that God does. There's so much that God does in our lives. Amen? I mean, there's a history that we all have with the Lord. 
And there is evidence after evidence of his faithfulness and his goodness. And, and, and Abraham's not like, well, I don't care about any of that, God. You know, almost treating God as if he's done nothing for him lately. And that's not the kind of doubt we're talking about. God help us to not doubt God like that. You know, you know what I'm talking about? When you love somebody, and uh, maybe this happens in the marriage relationship, and, uh, you know, there's, there's sometimes this tendency when we're struggling in our interpersonal relationships to look at each other, and, you know, there's, there's no record of right. The Bible says we shouldn't keep a record of wrong, but there should be a record of right. There should be a record of blessing, right? Hey, when, when we're loving each other, we can look at that history of faithfulness in our relationships and say, you know what, babe, I might be struggling right now, but you, you are such a faithful wife. You've been so good. And none of the things that you have done to me as an expression of love have, have been forgotten. God, help us in our interpersonal relationships. I hope this makes sense today. But God, help us in our interpersonal relationships to remember the good things that we have done for each other. And the same should be said in our relationship with God. It's not, it's not as if we live every day thinking, well, you know what, God, you haven't done anything for me. What have you done for me lately? No, God has done a lot God has been amazingly faithful. Our starting point should be, God, you've got this great history of faithfulness to my life, and that's where I'm going to start. You know, I think that, I think what's happening in Abraham's life, right, he's not accusing God. He's not attacking the character of God. He's not discarding the faithfulnesses of God. I think he's in that place that that man was in. You remember there was a man in the gospel accounts, Mark chapter 9, Matthew chapter 17, he had a a son who was demon-possessed. And the disciples, three of them, were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. The other disciples were down in the valley, and this man with this demon-possessed boy had asked them to exorcise this demon from his son. And the disciples, you guys remember the story? The disciples were unable to do it. So as Christ comes down with Peter and with James and with John, he rolls into this scene his disciples have been ineffective, and the man asks him, please, I've asked your disciples to help me. Can you, can you exercise this demon from my son? He says to the man, if you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man in that moment said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I'm not discounting who you are. I'm just acknowledging that within me right now, there is, a, there is a struggle. There is a tug of war. There is a battle that's happening. And I want to lean in in this moment. Can you help me? Can you strengthen me? I think that that's where Abraham is at. I think Abraham is at that place where it's like there was this sincere desire to trust in God, but there was this internal adversity that he was experiencing simultaneously but what he chooses to do, and I don't want to get ahead, but what he chooses to do is he chooses to believe. And I just want to say this to you today. Belief is a choice. To believe is a choice. Unbelief, listen, unbelief is a choice. Sometimes we treat unbelief in a passive way as if it is just this thing that happens to us. It is not just a thing that happens to us. When the revelation of God has been given to us, we have the opportunity either to choose to believe or to choose not to believe. Abraham's in this place. I believe it's a self-imposed box of unbelief. The Bible says, and it's all illustrative here, he's in his tent. He's in his tent. He's cloistered himself. He's boxed, boxed himself in. And all that Abraham can see in this moment is what he doesn't have and then also what he does have. He looks at the absence of the heir that was born between a relationship uh, between him and Sarah. Didn't have that. God hadn't fulfilled it. He was expecting her to be pregnant. Years had passed. That promise had been unfulfilled. And so what he does see, what he does have is Eliezer. Eliezer is... The, the chief of servants in the house of Abraham. And so in this moment, he's like, well, God, you know what? You haven't given me an heir. My wife hasn't been pregnant. Is this the way it's going to be that, that my lead servant is going to be the one through whom you fulfill this promise? 
And, you know, Abraham is not, not out of bounds necessarily for Abraham to think this because this was a culturally approved option. You know, in that particular era, if you didn't have a son by birth and you had things to pass on, then the person you could pass them on to was your lead servant. It was, you know, a totally appropriate in the culture at the time. And so Abraham, listen, he's in the tent. He's seeing with the eyes of flesh. He's looking at the only options that he has. He's taken God out of the equation, right? He's no longer seeing the promise of God. He's no longer seeing the power of God. He's no longer thinking, what God can you do in this? He's thinking, God, how can I figure this out myself? You know, that is a toxic cycle of thinking, and it's godless. I'm not saying that Abraham was godless. I'm saying that the process of his thinking did not include God any longer. And when you take God out of your thinking, when you take the promise of God out of your thinking, when you take the word of God out of your thinking, when you take the power and the capacity of God out of your thinking, your world begins to shrink. Your world begins to shrink. Now, now what you're looking at is your own ability, your own capacity, and all of your resources. And now, now you've, gone from, you've gone from this place of, God, you can do it. God, with you all things are possible. God, I'm trusting and believing you. I think that was his heart when he left Ur. When he left Ur. <laughs> I sound like a hick today. When he left Ur. <laughs> I should have worn a flannel. <laughs> I'm just playing. I think when he left Ur, he's like, man, he's on this high. This is a mountaintop, right? It's from one victory to another victory. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, time goes by, and, and the adversity has come, and the absence of fulfillment is, is in front of his face. It's in front of his face, and his world begins to shrink, and he's not including God in the equation anymore, and he starts to be filled with anxiety and stress and fear. That's what happens. You take your eyes off of God, you will be living under anxiety, stress, and fear. And now it's going to be, hey, how can I figure this out? How can I bring this to pass? Hey, God, this is all you gave me. This is the equation. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. You've, you've forgotten the biggest variable. I hate to get all mathy on you today. But you have forgotten the biggest variable. The biggest variable in the equation is the Lord. The, the fact is this, like... That's, <laughs> that's just true. Come on. Come on. Like what are all the other variables, variables compared to him anyway? They're insignificant. Right? You've got yourself. You've got your circumstances. And then you've got God. But if you pull God out, you have nothing. You have nothing. And that's why you begin to be filled with fear. That's why you begin to look at the, the time frame, the time horizon on your life, and it's starting to decrease, and you're thinking, man, you know what? I'm not where I should be. I don't have what I should be. You know, these things that I want are not being fulfilled. My time is shrinking, and so how can I make it happen? How can I make it happen? Look, you go down that road, you're going to make some major mistakes in your life, and now you're living back in the place that you were before you were a Christian, right? This little box that doesn't have God in it. So what happens here? God blows his box of unbelief away. That's what God does because God loves Abraham. God blows his box of unbelief away by three things. Revelation, reminder, and renewal. Revelation, reminder, and renewal in this order. So what happens? After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Look, God sticks his nose into Abraham's business. Aren't you thankful for that? God sticks his nose into Abraham's tent. What's going on in here? Like, what the heck is going on in here, son? What are you doing? Where you been? What you thinking? Like, you're all spinning out. You're in this cycle of dysfunction and toxicity in your brain. And you know what God does? Because he loves us so much, he sticks himself into our business. He goes straight into the tent and he gives beautiful revelation. Do not be afraid, Abram, for I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. In the middle of his spinning, God starts to sort out this toxicity of unbelief and doubt in Abraham's life, first by a revelation of his character. Hey, I just 
not, not the topic for today, but man, thank God for the power of his word. Thank God for the power of his word. Like you don't, you don't have to wait. You don't have to be in a spot where it's like, man, I wish God would do that in my life, you know, that, that, that I could have that type of vision. Hey, he gave you the canon of scripture. He, he talks all the time. He talks all the time. You know, thank God for words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophetic words, but you don't have to wait for God to talk to you. You can open the book. And so this is what happens. He gives a revelation. He speaks right into Abraham's life, right to the heart. Hey, Abraham, I am your shield. Don't be afraid. Stop being filled with anxiety. Stop spinning out, right? Stop driving the train down the wrong track. I am your shield. I'm your protector. I'm your defender. I'm your champion, right? Let me say that to you again today because he said it to him. He says it to you. I'm your protector. I'm your defender. I'm your champion, Okay, you're not your own defender, you're not your own protector, and you are not the champion of your life. God is. When he says, I am your shield, that's exactly what he means. Let me put it in modern vernacular. God is saying, I've got you. I've got you. Stop stressing out. Why are you stressing out? You are in the palm of my hand. And then he says, and all of this is important, he says, I am your exceedingly great reward. Abraham, I'm your shield. I'm championing your life. And not only that, but I am your exceedingly great reward. It's not the miracle, but the miracle maker. It's not the reward, it's the rewarder. It's not the promise, it's the promiser. God is saying to Abraham, it's me, it's me, it's me. Even in the fulfillment of this beautiful promise, if it were just to be fulfilled, that would never satisfy you because Abraham, all these things point to me. I am your reward. Man, I think it's so important for us to remember that God is our exceedingly, look, he just qualifies it in such an amazing way. He is our exceedingly great reward. He is incomparable. He is better than any promise that he's given that might be fulfilled in our lives. He is, in fact, the one that all those things point to. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he, listen, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is the rewarder. Well, what does God reward us with? God rewards us with himself. Like, that's the whole point of that verse. The whole point of that verse is if you seek God, God will give himself to you. That's what agape love means. It is the self-giving love of God. In this relationship with God, you get spiritual gifts. You get eternal life. You get provision. You get guidance. I, I could go on and on. The list is long, but all those things are about Jesus. All those things are about him. You know, you can serve. This is just so crazy. You can serve God and have it not even be about God. You know that? You can can use your spiritual gifts and have it not be about Jesus. Like, let me just ask you a question. If you took Jesus out of eternal life, what would eternal life be? It would be absolutely nothing. It would be purposeless. It would be without value. The whole point of eternal life is that we are going to be gathered around the throne in heaven, centered on the Father and the Lamb. Yeah. Yeah, and I just want to make, I just want to make a subtle distinction because sometimes, you know, we get all focused up on the wrong thing. God, how are you going to use me? What are you going to do? You know, God, how are you going to bless me? What can you give me? Well, wait, wait a minute. God does all that stuff, but all those things lead us back to Jesus anyway. He is our exceedingly great reward. He gives revelation, right? Pulling Abraham out of the pit that he's dug for himself, the box that he's made. He gives reminder. The second thing is this. He gives reminder of his promise. He gives reminder of his promise. He says, no, no, Abraham, it's not Eliezer. It's not Eliezer. One will come from from your own body. Like I said, let me just say it. Like I said, Abraham, remember what I said. Remember what I said. Stop trying to figure this out with the options that you have. Because these might be your only options, but they're not my only options. Right? These things that you see that you're, you're leaning into and relying on, 
They may be your only options, but they're not my only options. I think God, in a way, is saying to Abraham, don't limit me. Don't limit me by what you see. Don't replace me. Don't replace me. He's not saying this to Abraham, but I think for sure he's saying it to us today. Hey, don't replace me with your financial capacity. Don't replace me with your charismatic personality. Don't replace me with your willpower and your drive for success. Don't, re- don't replace me by your work ethic and what you can accomplish in the power of your own might. Don't replace me. Abraham, don't limit me. Don't replace me. Abraham, it's not your positive thinking. It's not you focusing on attractive thoughts so that they become reality. You know this is a big deal today? This is a big deal today. People are like, hey, if you can just, and this is no new thing, right? I was talking with the kids about this last night, and they're, they're telling me how so many young people are talking about manifesting. You know, hey, you, you, can, you can manifest reality if you just think it into existence. And so I said to them, hey, that's no new thing. You know, that's been around for a long time. I mean, that's new ageism. That's the power of positive thinking. That's, that's, and it's all absolutely false. It's all absolutely false. And it's, and it's false for the Christian, too. Like, you really think that God wants you just to think positive thoughts so you can create your own reality? Let me ask you a question. Whose power is that? That's not God's power. That's your power. Whose will is that? Whose desires are those? Well, those aren't necessarily God's. They're yours. What you need to focus on, what you and I need to focus on, is the Word of God. We need to focus on the promise of God. If we're going to affirm something, if we're going to acknowledge something, if we're going to claim something, i got no problem with the word claim because the Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I will claim the promises of God because they belong to me through Christ. They belong to me through Christ. And so if we're going to use our thoughts for anything, it ought to be to focus on God and his promises. So much of our dysfunction comes when we take our thought life off of God and his word and we put it on ourself and our own personal desires. That spin cycle, you guys, you know you wash your clothes? I hope. We were going to talk to some of you after the service about this. No, I'm just kidding. And you got the spin cycle, right? So you go through the whole wash cycle, then it goes on spin, and man, that washing machine is hauling. It's hauling. Well, some of you are, you're on spin cycle. You're hauling right now. You're, there's, this, there's this thing that's happening in your life, and I just want to encourage you, stop it. Stop the spin cycle. Pastor, I don't know how. I'm just, I'm spinning right now. Well, you can stop the spin cycle by focusing on the Word of God and centering your mind on Him. There's revelation, there's revelation, there's reminder, and then there's the renewal of Abraham's perspective. Man, this is just so beautiful, right? Like a father with a a son. I think the biggest obstacle to Abraham's believing was his self-imposed, short-sighted perspective. Like all he could see was all that he was allowing himself to see. So what, and, and you know, the tent is just symbolic of this. What does God do? Well, God speaks revelation. God gives him reminder. And then God renews Abraham's perspective by pulling him out of the tent. By pulling him out of the tent. The Bible says in verse 5, then he brought him outside. He brought him outside. Maybe your translation says he took him outside. God took him out. God took Abraham out. God, it's almost as if, and the picture is this, he takes him by the hand and he pulls him out of the box that he had made for himself. And then not only that, he says to Abraham, look up to the stars. Look up to the stars, multitudes in number beyond being able to be numbered, innumerable. There are a lot of things that God could have directed attention, Abraham's attention to. He could have said, Abraham, look at the grains of the sand, but he didn't want him looking down. He could have said to Abraham, hey, look at the grains of wheat, but he didn't want him looking around. What he says is, Abraham, look at the stars in heaven. I want you to look up. I want you to look up. Stop looking down. Stop looking around and start looking up to heaven because your redemption draws near. He says, do you see the stars? Do you see the stars? Your descendants will be more in number than all of the stars. See, Abraham, what it is that I'm going to do. 
Listen, when Abraham looked with his own eyes, he saw Eliezer. But when he looked through his eyes, when he looked with his eyes, he saw Eliezer. When he looked through his eyes, he saw God. God says, look at the stars, but don't just look at them for what they are. Look at them and see what I'm going to do in your life. See with the eyes of faith. See with the eyes of faith. Look, when you see with the eyes of faith, pretty soon it's not like, God, this is all that I have. It's like, God, look at all that I have. Look at all that I have. Look, because I can make that shift in thinking because all that I have is in the hands of God. And even if what I have is little in the eyes of the world, it is not little when it's placed in the hands of the Lord. Hey, how are we going to feed these 5,000? Lord, you know what? I mean, there's no stores around. Just send them away. No, we're going to do something. Bring what you got. Andrew grabs a little guy, brings his Star Wars lunch pail to Jesus, <laughs> cracks it open with that lunch pail smell, and Jesus pulls out the few barley loaves and the few sardines. And what happens? He takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he multiplies. He takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he multiplies those few things in the hands of Jesus fed 10,000 people because when they're placed in his hands, he does the miracle. Stop looking with your eyes and start seeing through your eyes. Use the eyes of faith. Abraham here moves from doubt to discovery and victory. So this is the process, right? He's in this self-imposed box of unbelief, wasn't, wasn't, uh, that God chose for him to be unbelieving. It was a decision that he made himself. God loving, lovingly pulls him out of that through revelation, through reminder, through, through renewal of perspective. Renewal of perspective, right? Renewal, maybe your perspective needs to be renewed today, that you need to set your eyes on the Lord. And as he does this, he moves from doubt to discovery and ultimately to victory. The amazing thing about verse 6 is that it is one of the most important verses in all of the Bible because Abraham's journey becomes a pattern for everyone who would ultimately be a friend of God. Abraham's journey of faith here, the place where Abraham lands, right? He is in the valley of indecision, and he makes a choice to believe. And this one simple verse becomes a pattern for everyone ultimately who would come to the Lord to fundamentally be a friend of God and to see God move through their lives. In this indecision, what's birthed in Abraham's life is belief. He chooses belief. I said this before in different words, but I just want to say it again because sometimes when we think about believing, we see it the wrong way. I want to tell you what belief is not. It is not an inherited disposition. You know, some people, it's, it's not a personality type. This is what I'm saying. Sometimes we're like, well, you know, that person, that's just the way they are. You know, they're, they're just believing folk. They're just believing people. They're kind of like built that way. This is just the disposition that they naturally are born with. Hey, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about belief in the Bible, some people say, well, you know what, their circumstances, if I had their circumstances, right? don't tell me you've not done this before, if I had their circumstances, but God's made my life so hard, you know, God, I'd be, God, I'd, look, God, I'd be more believing, and pretty soon, you know what, we, bl we blamed our unbelief on God, whoa, we blamed our unbelief on God. It's like, hey, you know, if my life was like their life, well, yeah, I'd be believing too, God, but look what you've done in my life. Look how hard you've made it for me. Look how miserable this is. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now you're blaming your unbelief, which, which is a function of your own decision. God has given to every person a measure of faith as a gift. It's up to you to use it the right way. How are you using the gift of faith, the capacity to believe in your life? It is a gift, man. If you use it the wrong way, it's not going to be a gift any longer. It's not a matter of personality. It's not a matter of circumstances in your life. It's not a function of the house you grow up in. You know, uh, well, if, if I grew up, you know, going to a Christian school and, and I was raised in a godly family, I'd be, I'd be a believing person too. Hey, listen, my, my kids, our kids have grown up in a Christian school. 
I mean, apart from the time that Rachel homeschooled them, which was amazing, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. They've grown up, obviously, you know, in a Christian home. They've grown up in a family that serves God. But that does not make my kids Christians. They have to put their own trust and faith in the Lord. They've got to choose. They've got to make the choice. And I'll tell you right now, that's a journey. That's a journey with some high highs, and that is a journey with some low lows. Fundamentally, today, you're going to make a choice. I can't make the choice for you, right? I can't make the choice for you. And coming to church and being exposed to the things of God is not the same as believing. Because the word of God can be spoken. God can even give a word that's just straight up for you. Like he gave to the woman at the well. Hey, you've had five husbands and the person you're living right with right now isn't even your husband. And she's like, whoa, dude, you're a prophet. Like that's straight up. No one else could know that. How'd you know that? That's crazy. <laughs> and that's like the modern translation. And, and you know... And you know, the same thing can happen here. It's like you're sitting here and, and all of a sudden you're not expecting it. You just rolled into church to roll into church. Someone dragged you here, you know, maybe. Or maybe you're here because, hey, life pretty much sucks. And so maybe if I go to church, it'll count for something. And God, God whoever, whoever this God is, will do something. And, and so you're thinking, man, it's got to count for something. And so you're present, right? You're present and you're exposed to the truth. And God might be even blowing your mind with something, right? You're like, man, pastor, how could that guy know this? Did somebody email him? I get this all the time. Did my wife email you, pastor? Because I'm like, no, no. And inevitably, it's a guy talking about his wife asking that question. I rarely get it the other way. I rarely have a wife saying, hey, did my husband tell you something like, I don't know what that means, but we'll figure it out later. But, you know, God can speak directly to you. And, and yet, at the same time, you, just leaving, just leaving and letting that word fall to the ground, well, it'll mean not, it, it won't just mean nothing. You'll be responsible for that revelation. I'm just saying this today. You have to choose. You have to choose. You have to make your own choice. Unbelief is a choice, and so is belief. Abraham choose, chooses to believe, right? He's at this intersection, and, and you, can't, you can't have both simultaneously forever. It's like, i got to make a choice. I'm either going to go right or I'm going to go left. I'm choosing right. I'm choosing to believe. God, I, revelation check, reminder check, renewal of my perspective check, check. Thanks for pulling me out of the tent. I'm making a choice to believe. And all of a sudden, what happens when he believes? The Bible says, and the Lord... He believed in the Lord. He believed in Yahweh. Not an institution, not an organization, not a group of people, not some miracle that God was going to do. He put his belief in the person of God. And what did God do? He accounted it to him for righteousness. He accounted it to him for righteousness. The word account means that there was a transaction that was made. So it was like a transfer of funds. Okay, you know when you do a transfer of funds, you're taking money from your savings account, putting it into uh, your checking account because all your checks are going to bounce or, or all of your, you know, online bill payments are going to bounce. So what do you do? You move one, you move money from one account to another account. When Abraham believed God, this is what God did. God took his own righteousness. God took his own unlimited perfection and he moved it over into Abraham's account. In other, words, in other words, God gave to Abraham what Abraham did not have on his own, right? Because all of us, there are none who are righteous, no, not one. There are none who seek after God. Like, who in this room could say that they are righteous before God just by the very actions that they do? None of us could say that. What happens to Abraham? God says, because you've believed, I'm taking my righteousness and I'm putting it into your account. The biblical term for this is justification, I'm justifying you. I'm justifying you. I'm giving you right standing. Righteousness means to be conformed to an ethical, moral, or standard. All of us fall short of that. The only way we can stand before God is if he gives us his righteousness, and his righteous, righteousness comes through faith. It comes through belief. I want to give you two sections of Scripture today. Because this verse gets pulled into the New Testament. This is the very basis. This verse is the very basis 
of Paul's uh, theological understanding of justification. I mean, this is the question. How do we approach God? How do people get to God? All of that was determined right here in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So the process of approaching God is faith, not our works. Romans chapter 4, verse 3, this is big. Romans chapter 4 uh, says this, faith is the process. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? So if we're talking about works, you know, great patriarch, Abraham, the Jews were looking to him and the way he lived his life. And Paul's like, hey, listen, if we're talking about the way he comported himself, what do we conclude? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Like maybe compared to other people, Abraham has something to, 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 to glorify in, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted. There's a transaction. There's a transfer of funds. His faith is accounted for righteousness. In other words, Paul is simply saying, hey, the process today in approaching God is, is the same. It was established, in a sense, by Abraham. Abraham believed God. It wasn't his efforts. It wasn't his moral works. It wasn't just because he left Ur. It wasn't because he was extravagant or generous in his giving. No, it wasn't any of that. It was simply faith. And when he had faith, God did something extraordinary. Faith is the process. Faith is the process, not your church attendance, not because you're part of Calvary Chapel, it's faith. Faith is the process, and the Messiah is the point. Let's go to the next verse. The gospel, or the Messiah, is the object, or the point of our faith. Paul says this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. You guys with me today? Okay, good. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, who's that? That's you and me, preached the gospel. Whoa, wait a minute. Like we've got Paul saying the gospel was preached thousands of years before the incarnation of Christ to Abraham. He preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. Paul is saying when God gave Abraham that promise, it was the first expression to Abraham of the gospel the one who would be chosen, the one who would be anointed, the one who would be selected, the good news that God was going to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, and that that promise fundamentally would come through the seed that would be born of Abraham and Sarah. Listen, faith, this is why this section of Scripture, man, is so uniquely personal to us, but it is so expansive in what it offers to the world. Faith is the process of approaching God. The gospel is the focus. Faith in Christ is the focus. You know, this time of year we're celebrating the incarnation of, of Jesus and let me just wrap this up today by saying that this is as we celebrate Christmas what we're celebrating is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah in you all the nations of the world will be blessed right when when we think about the coming of the son of God what we're saying is God was faithful to Abraham not to just bring Isaac but to ultimately bring Jesus. There is a God who loves you today. There is a God who loves you. And God has provided for, for you to approach him, not through your efforts, not through your positive thinking, not by you sorting out your issues yourself, but for you to simply believe in Jesus, the Son of God, to put your trust and faith in him and so receive the gift of everlasting life. Number one, that's, that's, that's for those of you who have yet to take that step of faith. Number two, today, if you're struggling with doubt, I want to encourage you to choose to believe God. 
Today, if you're struggling with doubt, maybe you're, you've been living in this self-imposed box. Your world has been shrinking. Today, God is pulling you out of that, and he's saying, look to me. Abandon yourself to me in faith because I am your shield. I am your shield in your exceedingly great reward. And Father, thank you today for your word. God, help us as we've been challenged. God, we've been challenged not, not to just sit and consume a message, but we've been ch challenged to believe, to make a choice. God, in a sense, to draw a line in the sand or to recognize that we're at an intersection. And we, we can't continue in a place where we're conceding our belief to unbelief. Today we want to be trusting in you. We want to be abandoning ourselves wholly and completely to the revelation that you have given to us. Today we need to be reminded of the beauty of your promise. And maybe we need a renewal of our perspective. Today, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, hey, maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And the, and the fact may be for, for you, it may be this, that when you've thought about Christianity, all you've thought about is people working their way to God, fixing the problems in their life, trying to be better people, trying to make the right decisions, and in all of that somehow that God counts that. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Old Testament taught. That's not what the New Testament teaches. The only way that we can have right standing before God, the only way that we can get to Him and be accepted by Him is by believing. And not believing, I'm, I'm not talking about believing in ourselves. I'm not talking about believing in an institution. The Bible says to believe in Jesus. Today, maybe you've come in and you've never put your trust and faith in Christ. And, and yet God has been speaking to you, calling you to come. In a way, he's been kind of taking you by the hand. Well, you need to make a choice today. You need to choose to believe in Christ so that you can be given the righteousness of God, so that you can be a child of God. So today that you can experience the forgiveness that only God can bring to your life. You can leave this place with the gift of everlasting life if you choose to believe today. If this is you this morning, I want to pray for you right where you're sitting. I'm just going to ask you, would you raise your hand? You'd say, Derek, that's me. I want to believe in Jesus. I want to trust. I don't want to be unbelieving anymore. I want to follow him. And stretch your hand up high. Let me see who you are. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. See your hand in the back, in the center. I see your hand in the back, in the center. Thank you. I see your hand over here in the center on my right. That's awesome. So good. So good. Look, you can come just as you are. That maybe you just, your life is a mess. I came to Christ when my life was a mess, and He received me. It's not your righteousness, it's His. Anybody else? He can unravel the mess that you've made. Thank you. I see your hand. You can put your hands down today. Also, for those of you who are Christians, you know, maybe for some of you, you've, your, your world has been shrinking your world has been shrinking. Your life has been filled with fear. Maybe you've got, taken your eyes off of God. And today you know he's spoken to you. He's, he's calling you. He's calling you out of that to himself. And I, I want to give you an opportunity today just to confess that you're making the choice to believe. Not just hearing a message and, and maybe thinking about it later on. No, making a choice right here and now. Because 
Belief is a choice. But today, if this is you, I want to pray for you too. Would you raise your hand? As a believer, you're saying, hey, Lord, today, I'm not going to dwell in this place of unbelief and indecision anymore. God bless you. And thank you for raising your hand. And I see your hand in your hand in your hand. Today, you're saying, Lord, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to plant my flag. I'm going to choose to believe in the revelation that you've given to me. To set my mind upon your word, God, to stop this cycle of dysfunctional thinking. God bless you right here. Thank you so much. God bless you. I see you right here. It's awesome. Love you. Appreciate you. In the back on my left. You're among friends today. Awesome. You can put your hands down. And Father, thank you. God, we love you. We do love you. Bless these as today as you've ministered to them and in the specific way that they've needed today, we pray as they trust and believe in you, in the Lord, that God, you would fulfill all that you desire in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.